Welcome everyone, it's the Crypto Lurk, and I am super excited to have on today Galia from Bangor. Galia, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. Now, we're going to be talking about Bangor today, but we're also going to be talking about a lot of different topics, particularly about EOS, because Bangor has been very involved in EOS for quite some time. So Bancor is actually one of the block producers, which I find is very, very cool. So there has been some talk going around about, you know, block producing not being profitable at the moment at the current prices. Is that true? Yeah, so um, a lot of good stuff in there. I'll start with this. Um, the Bancor team was one of, we went out to uh, visit Dan Larimer and the team in Virginia um, in January of last year, so January of 2018. Um, after having become really big believers uh, in the promise of EOS uh, ourselves, even going back before that, um, the EOS token generation event was just on the heels of the Bancor token generation event and uh, in the summer of 2017, at least when they began. Um, and so we really saw ourselves as kind of peers uh, in the industry and, and also kind of forging new ground in terms of uh, you know, the, the step functions that the industry was going through in terms of growth and, and awareness um, and, and also innovation. So we've been fans of the project for a long time. We wanted to go out and see it for ourselves. Um, one of the things that's challenging, I think, in the industry is a lot of, you know, uh, crypto tribalism or, or different views online, uh, online about different things. And, and for us, what was really important was understanding the tech. Um, and we wanted to go to the source and look under the hood. Um, and we did that. We had a great few days um, and we, we came out of there really convinced that the blockchain had a lot of promise that it would launch. And they said it would launch um, and, it, and it, it would work. And so we were really kind of uh, alone at that time um, in terms of at least uh, developers that were working in the Ethereum ecosystem and supporting EOS and being excited about the upcoming launch. And, and we've remained that way ever since. And we've been real champions um, of the system. Um, the Bancor uh, team founded a block producer, like you say, it's called uh, Liquidios. Um, it's not actually by Bancor, it's another entity, but it really um, was for us a, kind of a no-brainer way to dive deeper into the ecosystem, which is something that we needed to do in order to build the products uh, that we were building. So um, just a word about Bancor, what Bancor aims to do is uh, promote the advancement of the Bancor protocol, which is an asynchronous method for tokens to be converted. Uh, and the reason that we want to do this, we think it's so exciting, uh, is that it really allows for this token economy to emerge, the one that we're really excited about. It's really a, a means to an end. Uh, and that end is allowing anyone, any group, any community, any project, um, any city, you know, the, the list goes on, to create tokens in order to power their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. The only way that this can actually happen at scale is if there is a solution like Bancor to allow for continuous and autonomous and affordable liquidity, all the, all the things that Bancor tries to bring to the table. Um, now, in order for folks, in the long tail of folks, to make apps on blockchains, a lot more things are needed. This is kind of to your point. So one thing that's needed are great blockchains. Um, and, you know, Ethereum is a great blockchain. Now, EOS is a great blockchain, not without struggles, not without their independent uh, issues. Um, both of them actually are around scalability, but they take on very different uh, flavors in those different ecosystems. They have different uh, developer communities that are passionate about solving those problems in different ways. Um, and so uh, for us to achieve our mission of enabling uh, token creation to be uh, totally democratized, and to enable token liquidity to be totally automated, um, we needed to uh, explore the EOS ecosystem, explore the EOS blockchain, um, and there's really no better way to do that than, uh, than diving right in. Um, Liquidios, uh, as I said, is a, is a separate entity. We learned a, a tremendous amount from them. Um, and to your question about profitability, they're not profitable yet. Um, the resources that they earn from producing blocks on the EOS mainnet are first of all, quite modest still at this time um, and completely reinvested into the technology itself. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, it has not yet reached a kind of steady state where this is the stack that you need and, and no further investment in the architecture and the infrastructure is needed. Um, that said, even by being a non-profitable block producer, we've learned a tremendous amount about what's needed over there because, of course, 
in order for block producers to be excited about about working on the EOS ecosystem, it does need to um, have an incentive alignment. It needs to be a profitable endeavor, even though there are early adopters that are very passionate about the general project succeeding. Over time, what you need is for each stakeholder in the ecosystem to be effectively incentivized to do the best job at that job in order to, to continue to, to grow the community effectively. And so um, while it's not profitable yet, too, too profitable to be a blog producer, at least for us, hasn't been, um, it's really allowed us to understand a lot about what is needed uh, in order for that to be a, a great business to be in. Um, and why that being a great business is great for the ecosystem and ultimately great for users who can then have uh, great dApps developed on that blockchain. Now, Galia, I'm, I'm very happy that you mentioned the, the idea of the token economy and a vibrant token economy because what we see is there is a lot of cri um, there's a lot of tribalism in cryptocurrencies and that has had nothing but a net negative effect on the community. It's not a positive thing, all this tribalism. And you see Bancor and you're working across chains. You know, you've got an amazing Ethereum exchange, you have an amazing EOS exchange, which has been built up as well. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So Bancor X, what has been the feedback from the community on the EOS exchange Bancor X? Yeah, um, it's a it's a great question. It's a it's such an important topic. Um, I think there's not just a lot of tribalism in crypto. There's a lot of tribalism, period, um, in the world. Um, I think it's one of the things that prevents us the most from making progress. It prevents us the most from having healthy conversations about problems and potential solutions. And it prevents us from having, frankly, a lot more fun. I think we could be having much more um, fun together than uh, than we do uh, fighting apart. Um, that all said, the the response to the uh, EOS implementation of Bankrax has been tremendous. I mean. On the EOS alone side, folks are really excited about being able to convert EOS to EOS tokens, you know, with one second transaction fees, thanks to the underlying blockchain and, and its integrity, um, with no fees, um, thanks to the EOS structure and also the bank core structure, which takes no fees and is a, a not-for-profit um, exchange architecture. Um, and beyond the intra-blockchain exchange of EOS tokens, Folks are really excited about being able to move value between EOS and Ethereum. You know, we can we can fight all we want, but these are the great ecosystems of today. These are the ecosystems that developers are developing apps on, and where tokens uh, are thriving. Of course, there there are some other ones, but th these are the ones um, that are live today, where the action is happening, and to be able to move value seamlessly uh, from one chain to another is incredibly important. It may not be important for you if you're an Ethereum maximalist or an EOS maximalist, but it's definitely important to our users, who as we, we discussed right before we hopped on, um, need to be able to have a you know uh, an invisible blockchain experience. They need to be able to have an app experience. They need to be able to have an Uber or a Facebook experience and not think too hard about which blockchain their token or their application is living on, and definitely not think too hard about whether they can move from one app they love or dApp they love to another dApp they love, and you know what's going to happen in between. And so, folks are really excited about being able to move between these ecosystems. For us, it's a tremendous learning experience because we can see very clearly what's happening in, in both ecosystems. Um, so, just as an example, um, uh, volume is growing in EOS super exciting. That means that more developers are making more apps and more tokens are moving between wallets. Um, not only is volume growing, but we see more transactions uh, per wallet that are of a smaller, or more transactions per day of a smaller size um, than in the Ethereum ecosystem, which has other benefits like larger transactions and, and more volume, more, more total volume. It's also more um, a longer uh, ecosystem that has developed for more years. Um, what's interesting about the EOS uh, statistics is that when folks are trading smaller amounts of tokens, it's likely that they're actually using those tokens and moving between applications that need those tokens in order to be accessed rather than making uh, financial trades or, or what we call speculative trades. Um, what's really interesting about that to me is that it's the beginning of us moving to where I think we all want to go. Um, I don't think the only thing we want to do is create, a, you know, a bigger 
or a newer uh, or a faster financial casino. Um, so I think where we want to go is creating more different, creative, um, decentralized applications that allow people to benefit from you know the tremendous upside of of having decentralized uh, applications using things that that you like that aren't owned and controlled so intensely by by one center um, has huge huge upside to society and and it's much more than the upside of having you know better trading tools uh, for finance folks uh, to make money on on crypto uh, transactions so that's that's one thing we're really excited about seeing and to your question working in both ecosystems uh, I think for us gives us you know, really holistic perspective around where we're going. Um, and it challenges us also to, to keep uh, questioning our assumptions um, and to keep also re refocusing on the goal at hand. You know, the goal is not to make Ethereum great again or to uh, uh, have EOS be the one blockchain to rule them all. The goal is to have people benefit from decentralized technology, from decentralized applications, in our case, from more creation of more diverse forms of uh, tokens, currencies, money. Um, and that's, that's really the goal. So it's important for us not to lose sight of it. We see, obviously, what is being built in terms of this big, vibrant ecosystem full of lots of different players and lots of different dApps and having a, a good user experience for that is going to be so, so important moving forward. And so the the transfer of value across chains very easily. And it's really interesting, actually, what you're saying about the, the EOS tokens that are being used because people are going out and they're buying, you know, $10 worth of Karma tokens in order to go and use the Karma app. And that is very, very different in terms of adoption versus someone buying ten thousand dollars worth of a me say go because they want the price to go up that's i'm really encouraged to hear those kind of statistics coming out and i think it's worth noting as well that bancor is not looking to stop at ethereum and eos right i mean recently we've seen uh, some red picture red carpet pictures of you <laughs> with kobe bryant at nitron you did a selfie with justin's son is tron going to be the next blockchain that we see bancor integrating with so, you know, the little wins, the little perks uh, of the job. Um, it, I had a great time uh, at Nitron, the Tron uh, developer event in San Francisco. I'm also from the Bay Area, so it's always great uh, to get to go home or home-ish. And um, it's really interesting to kind of look at how the ecosystem is unfolding and where is the next uh, relevant place to build the Bancor X bridge. Um, like I said, we want to enable value to move seamlessly between people and between blockchains um, and the various blockchains that people are using. And so we look at things like, um, you know, developer adoption, um, user adoption. We look at the technology, um, and uh, and it's hard to know, right, where where the the action will be in the future. Um, we can't announce anything yet about the next uh, blockchain for Bancor X, um, but I can say that it will be uh, it will be where uh, it will be where things are most exciting. Mm. Mm. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. Well, we'll be looking forward to that without a doubt. And there's so much innovation going on across the different blockchains. And and again, it goes back to the idea of uh, maximalism being so inherently flawed in so many ways because there's so much innovation happening there's so many new token economies rising up and there's there's just so much so many exciting things so many exciting dapps one blockchain does not need to rule them all when it comes down to it now in terms of getting people to to use dapps more to to become more i guess familiar with uh you know using blockchain i mean it's amazing to have this easy transition of value but what else do you think is needed to really get people using decentralized blockchain-based applications? Yeah, so there's a couple things. Um, I mentioned it before, but we need strong, high-integrity, scalable underlying blockchains. Ethereum has progress to make on scaling. We're super confident that they're going to get there. They have a vibrant, incredible developer community. There's so much passion and capital um, in that ecosystem, so um, they'll get there. EOS. Um, great underlying blockchain, also challenged by resource scarcity, such as uh, RAM, for example, and CPU. 
Um, there are developers out there. Another project um, that that we help to to um, to co-found and that we advise is called Liquid DApps. Maybe you've heard of their uh, their DApp token, which is really looking at uh, virtualizing RAM and creating more accessible, affordable storage um, on these blockchains um, for developers. So that's the underlying piece of infrastructure. And there are other blockchains out there. You, you mentioned Tron. There's um, there are many, many more that are working to create high integrity base protocols, what we call layer one um, protocols. So blockchains need that, need them to be great, fast, cheap, affordable, easy to use, secure. Um, on a, as a second layer, we talked about liquidity, but you really do need tokens to be able to move seamlessly between all these blockchains or else, you know, you're in the intranet. Um, you're not in a, a real connected ecosystem. We've talked about that. Um, a third layer that's really important um, is the, the bridges between the existing financial infrastructure, let's call it the fiat world, and this new uh, emerging um, blockchain-based crypto world. Uh, if users cannot easily buy tokens with dollars or euros um, or yen, then you know it's game over for, for mass adoption. Um, those bridges uh, are really important. Um, it kind of leads me to the next layer, which is uh, in order for those bridges to be built well, um, the regulatory landscape, uh, clarifying, evolving, moving forward is essential. Um, you know, entrepreneurs don't, uh, entrepreneurs manage risk. Um, they don't look forward to taking on extenuating risk. Um, they, they weigh risk with the upside of innovation and the, the, the you know, passion for, for the problem that they're solving. Um, but we obviously need uh, to work within a healthy framework with existing business, existing uh, legal infrastructure. And so that piece, which is really connected to this uh, crypto to fiat bridge or fiat to crypto onboarding bridge, um, is really important that people feel safe and secure. They can buy things, that they can sell things, that um, you know you don't need a PhD in uh, securities law uh, to to navigate you know apps on your phone uh, in a compliant way. So I think that's a piece of infrastructure that uh, a lot of folks are making progress on. And as a, a final piece, kind of the top of the pyramid, I'll say end user applications that are needed, <laughs> that solve real problems. Um, that are end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, beautiful and easy to use. Um, we, we talked about it briefly, but we're going to have to get to a place where a user is using just an app, not a DAP. It is decentralized, but it's just an app in terms of the, the feeling and the functionality. We're going to have to get to that place where the blockchain uh, experience kind of fades into the background. And in the foreground for the user is, you know, slick, navigable, um, easy to use, well explained, um, easy to understand apps that are needed, right? We don't need apps we don't need. We need apps that we do need um, and that we do want. And uh, that's not to say that there's not a world of innovation ahead of us, you know, things we don't even know that we need or we don't even know that we want. But of course we have to be um, building uh, applications for real users. Uh, to use, and nobody is kind of looking to, um, you know, uh, waste their time. Though I guess use their time. There's there's a lot of stuff that we can do, but um, that those are the stacks of the pyramid: the underlying blockchain, liquidity between tokens, um, the fiat bridges so people can buy and sell uh, these tokens as needed, um, the regulatory and compliance uh, frameworks, and by the way, in, in various jurisdictions around the world, and end to end highly usable, well-designed, um, thoughtful apps. <laughs> Fun, of course, is a, an important part of the uh, the DAP experience as well. And it's like you said, it's actually about getting it to the point where it's not about DAPs, but just about apps that people are using. And the blockchain thing kind of takes a, a back seat because we are a very niche community at the moment. We see that, you know, our way that we perceive and want blockchain to be is very different from the average person who doesn't care and will never care. They just want it to work. And if they get some kind of token-based incentives that can be turned into real monetary value, then they might get really excited about it. But speaking of fun, by the way, I see that there has been a recent integration of Bancor with the Engine Wallet. Can you tell us a bit about mm. that uh, partnership? Yeah, totally. Um, we love the team at Engine. We love the product that they're building. Engine is actually one of the um, first 
uh, tokens and partners to adopt the Bancorp protocol um, back in the day in, in you know, early or let's call it mid-2017, uh, early on after uh, the token generation event. Uh, we're really grateful to them for their support. Um, you know, the, the early days are like uh, hacking through the forest with a machete. It's, uh, it's really in the trenches and it's fun to do that, like you said, um, with teams that are, you know, high integrity, high intellect, uh, cool people. So um, what Engine has done with their wallet uh, and what other developers can do is integrate uh, the Bancorp protocol, basically using an API, so that uh, in their wallet, which uh, is built for their users to do you know, their things, they can benefit from having the Bancorp protocol mechanism for token exchange within their wallet. Um, so folks can buy and sell tokens using the Bancorp protocol all within an engine experience within the engine wallet. And just kind of seamlessly in the back end, what's happening is that the tokens that you're buying and selling are, are interacting with the Bancorp network using the Bancorp protocol and formula and giving you the Bancorp price uh, for the token and also the Bancorp methodology, which is uh, you know a non-custody uh, type of token conversion. So you literally send the tokens you have to the smart contract and you get back the tokens that you want. You've never deposited them anywhere. They've never sat anywhere. Um, and and the Bancor uh, price is reflected to you before you buy. You, you, you know what you're going to get. You know how your transaction size is going to affect the price of the token that you're buying or selling. And so Engine uh, can offer this to their users um, without ever leaving the engine wallet and the engine user experience. Um, and it's a really cool integration. There are actually many, many more teams. Um, I'll just put one many. There's many more teams that are using uh, the Bancorp protocol uh, right now in this way via the API um, to enable their applications to function well and really take the liquidity problem off of their plate. Kind of to your point about you know tribalism and, and collaboration, um, there's really so much to build um, in order to make this thing work. It's just not to say that multiple teams shouldn't try to build the same thing and, and come with, with different ideas of how to do that, um, but there really is so much to build if the liquidity solution uh, is useful to a team like Engine to be able to focus more on the experience that they uh, are trying to give their users. Um, that's what APIs are for. Um, and it's really cool to be in this industry where so much of the development is open source um, and is you know available for others to kind of pick up where you leave off and, and take pieces and components. And that's part of the ethos of this ecosystem. It's not without its challenges, right? I mean, that's it's it's hard to build conventional businesses in these new and unconventional ways. Um, that said, we're really excited about moving towards a less conventional, um, business environment, we think there's a lot of challenges with the conventional environment. Um, and so, you know, while it's it's tough to come up with new solutions that we're certainly right off the bat, um, we see all of this integration and collaboration um, as really healthy for the industry to move forward. And hopefully we can um, kind of prove some points about uh, why it's great to be in this industry though it's hard and why it's uh, why it's great to um, to really like uh, collaborate on a, on a very uh, deep level with engine if you're an engine user and you're playing these games and things it's just it just makes it easy you don't have to worry about oh I've got to go and go somewhere and get my tokens etc you can just go and have fun now I want to change topics here a little bit it's a little more uh, serious uh, and perhaps somber topic uh, recently Bernard the former Bancor Foundation president has unfortunately passed away but I want to talk a bit about his legacy now he sure. said without touching the money system we have no chance in a period of 15 to 20 years to have a planet that we want to live on. When I read that, I was like, wow, that's that's great. That's It's so true and it's got so much vision behind it. So I want to just explore a bit with you. How did his vision kind of help influence the Bancor of today? And perhaps what is one of the key lessons that you could share with the audience that Bernard uh, imparted on you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking this. Um, it's a. It's been a sad couple of weeks uh, for us at Bancor, um, as you mentioned, since uh, Bernard's passing. Um, let's see where to begin. So Bernard's work has been incredibly influential on myself and on all of my co-founders, and 
is a big part of how, how Bancor uh, is and why Bancor is and, and what Bancor is doing. Um, Bernard is a, a, ha, was a prolific uh, author. He wrote over 13 books about this topic uh, of money, the future of money, rethinking money, money and sustainability, uh, money, new money for a new world, a bunch of books that I highly recommend. Literally, each time I read one of them, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed again um, just how, how brilliant and also intuitive uh, the writing is and how, how um, relevant his topics, these topics are really for everyone, everyone that you know, everyone that we all know. Um, and so his, his philosophy really um, is around looking at uh, financial ecosystems or economic ecosystems just like we look at uh, ecosystems in nature. Uh, he calls them complex flow networks, and, and that could be, you know, a rainforest is a complex flow network. It's got different uh, inputs and outputs, um, and an economy of a city or of a country or of the world is a complex flow network. Um, and, you know, a, a complex a, a network basically processes some volume um, of throughput, right? So if it's a uh, the, the rainforest, it's processing uh, water and food and sunlight, and there's some volume of, of physical energy that's moving through the ecosystem. And if it's an economy, it's really processing some volume of money uh, is the throughput for an economy. It's the kind of the measure of the, the activity of, of the economy. And uh, one of the key lessons that I have taken away from Bernard's work and that, that really inspires me all the time is that um, flow networks, um, have kind of two almost uh, binary uh, features. Uh, one is efficiency and one is uh, resilience. And they're sort of counter, uh, they're, they're counter related or, or um, kind of opposed to each other. So efficiency is the, you know, the speed by which you can process those throughputs um, and the amount of throughput that your system can handle. And often this leads to, you know, um, more single source uh, types of ecosystem. So, you know, you can think of efficiency, like if we could just eat one food and be totally nourished, it'd be much more efficient. We just grow that one thing, we eat that one thing. You know, if we can just wear one set of clothes all, all the time, we'd be much more efficient, just wear that one thing. You, you can get this concept of efficiency, why it's helpful and important. Um, it's often about uh, reducing redundancy. Um, on the other side of that equation, you have resilience, uh, which is the ability of a flow network to withstand or, or survive shock. Um, and so a shock is basically a change in the availability of the throughput. Um, and so in a natural ecosystem, a shock can be a weather-related shock. You know, suddenly there's too much water or not enough water or too much heat or not enough heat. Um, too much of this food, not enough of that food. Um, and in an economic uh, infrastructure, a shock can be a financial crisis. Like uh, the leaders of your country just printed four trillion new units of the thing to do the thing and you know it, it de devalued the currency or you had a war or a natural disaster or some other um, problem that, that led to the collapse of your currency or to the de rapid devaluation of your currency or to the lack of trust in the currency, and now your, your complex flow network, your economy, is not very resilient at all uh, if it only has one uh, throughput, um, which is how our, our economy is structured today. Each country, one currency. Um, ecosystems in nature are much more diverse. We know this, right? There's not only one thing you can eat. There's not only one source uh, of water or sunlight in a rainforest and, and things like that. And so ideally they can adapt to shocks as they come. And, and with the financial infrastructure, we're in a very, very uh, fragile uh, system architecture. And we see this with crisis after crisis after crisis. Um, and we see this with a lot of economic indicators that we never solve. We just kick down the road, um, you know, this, this concept of debt and uh, the deficit and, and these things that, that we all hear about, but maybe don't quite know how to get our heads around, especially if, we're, if we don't, you know, work or study in the topic specifically. And so this concept of, you know, you can be very efficient and we talk about efficiency a lot as kind of the, the ultimate aim of an economy or the ultimate aim of, of anything that we do. Sure, efficiency is great, has a lot of uh, great outcomes, but it has some 
there's there's another side to this coin. Even digital coins have two sides. And uh, the other side here to efficiency is resilience. And so just to bring it back to kind of how this work uh, inspires uh, our work and, and how I think it's very inspirational kind of in life in general is this concept of balance. Um, you don't benefit from being totally efficient and not resilient at all. And you don't benefit from being totally resilient and not efficient at all. What I feel that we're aiming for is a kind of balance. And balance isn't uh, necessarily 50-50, and there's no easy way to measure where balance is. It's a process of calibration. But uh, the idea economically is certainly not to overvalue efficiency at the cost or the expense of resilience. Resilience is really important especially when it's measured in human suffering, right? When we have financial crises, when we have these shocks, we have a fragile system. Sure, on the meta, you measure it in, in centuries, like we're resilient, we're still here, sure. But in those crises, we have so much collateral damage uh, that's measured in real human suffering, folks getting evicted from their houses, losing their jobs, not being able to put food on the table, not being able to send their kids to college, ripple effects from not being able to afford education for your family um, and all, all the kind of malaise um, that, that we're aware of in terms of access uh, to stable financial systems. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a long story and I could say so much more and I, I just would highly encourage folks to, uh, to check out the work of Bernard Leotard, to, to buy his books, read his books, a ton of stuff is online. Um, he has a really cool and great website. I recently wrote a blog post in, in uh, his honor and uh, memorializing his life and work. It's on our blog at uh, blog.bancor.network. Um, highly recommend uh, reading his stuff. It's, it's not crypto uh, specific at all, and it's not overly um, financial in nature. It's really, really accessible concept uh, content about this concept of money, why we have it, why we need it, and how it could get better. Can we just take money as this kind of given thing that's out there and somebody else takes care of, we don't really think about it, we don't really talk about it that much. I, mean, I see we talk about it all the time, but most people don't seem to talk about it very much, just you need to get more of it to have the things you want, not why do we have it at all, or how does it work best, or how do we have a system that is not exclusionary to so many people. And it's like you said, that there is real collateral damage to the current financial system, and that's something that often gets lost in translation to a lot of people that there are people who are on the short end of the stick here. Now, I wanted to, as a final topic today, to explore the idea of what Bancor has been doing in Kenya. So you have a stable coin project which has been running in Kenya. So you can share the updates about that, what has been the impact of that project, the vision behind doing it, maybe any of the pain points that people who are participating in that project have experienced. Yeah, absolutely, and it's it's really related uh, to what we just discussed, um, which is that one of the um, solutions that Bernard was really excited about and did a lot of research on and worked towards is this topic uh, of community currencies or complementary currencies. Basically, his answer, and an answer that many have come to um, for not having just one source of fuel in the economy today, the, the national money is having more money. Um, community generated money, uh, community currencies, which are complementary to the national money, not uh, not meant to replace it, but to supplement it. Um, and so we've been running pilots like this for a long time. And the one that you mentioned um, is a super cool project uh, in Kenya. It's outside of Nairobi. We do it in partnership with a not for profit on the ground there called Grassroots Economics. Highly encourage people to check out their work. Really inspiring folks and inspiring projects. Um, and basically what we do there is, um, these are actually communities that have been printing their own local paper money um, for a while now because they just can't get access to the national money, the Kenyan shilling. Sometimes they can, never enough, not in any predictable manner. A lot of these folks are seasonal workers um, who have work in season and then don't uh, in other seasons. Um, a lot of the work that they can find is outside of their communities, which uh, requires long commutes away from home, away from their families in order to get the Kenyan shillings and bring them back and, and do commerce with them. And so these paper currencies were kind of a community generated solution to this problem, which is, hey, can we collaborate amongst ourselves um, in any better way than just barter and favors? Can we actually systematize uh, commerce here, um, and, and they print this, 
these paper bills to that end. Now we all know there's some challenges with printing your own paper bills. And so what we have done there is helped those communities digitize uh, their local currencies um, and using the Bancor protocol also allow very efficient, affordable, and, and just automated uh, trade between these local currencies. So there's five different communities and each had their own currency. How do you collaborate uh, if you don't know, um, you know, what the exchange rate should be between your community currency and another community currency. And this is really the problem that Bancor was born to solve, truly, um, is how can we have this proliferation of currencies that might be that more fuel for our complex flow network, that might be that more diverse monetary ecosystem that leads to more resilience and stability and abundance for people who might be today excluded from the, you know, amazing and also problematic financial infrastructure that we have um, and enable this uh, fluid exchange of value between people or fluid creation and, and transfer of value between people and communities. Um, and so on the ground in Kenya with grassroots economics, um, we have done a lot of cool things. So one is, like I said, digitizing the paper currencies and not only digitizing them, but putting them on the blockchain. Um, and for this project, we work on the Ethereum blockchain, actually a side chain called the POA network, uh, which enables us to kind of uh, lump a bunch of transactions together to save on gas fees. Of course, you can't have end users paying gas fees to use their local community currencies. They didn't have money to begin with. They definitely can't pay those fees. Um, and so that's, a, that's an interesting uh, affordability and scalability challenge uh, there. And, and, and there's a cool solution uh, in place that lets us run these pilots. Um, so we've digitized them, we've blockchainized them, um, we've bancorized them, meaning that between the communities you can have this, uh, this um, liquidity. Um, and we've also adapted the app itself um, to a protocol called USSD, which is a non-smartphone implementation. So not all the folks on the ground in these communities have smartphones. Of course, eventually uh, they may, but today they don't. And so if you are creating a solution for an emerging economy and it only works on iPhone, then, uh, you know, the folks, the people there are not going to be able to use it, at least not all of them. Um, and so we've adapted the application um, to work on feature phones, Java phones, um, and even more than that, we've adapted the application to not need an internet connection, which is just wild that you can move blockchain tokens, um, community currencies in this case, uh, between Java phones without internet. Um, because again, if you're making an app for an, uh, an emerging or a marginalized community that relies on the internet, then you're excluding folks who can't get access to the internet. Um, these, uh, these phones use cellular networks, and so we're able to um, move the tokens between the users and between their wallets um, using feature phones on cellu cellular, cellular networks. Um, and it's a huge um, passion project for us because this is really uh, one of the main areas that we, uh, that we see growth um, in the future and we see, um, you know, fairness and we see access and we see creativity and kind of the emerging uh, long tail or class of entrepreneurs that will be able to finally use these, they'll be able to use these technologies um, to meet the needs of their communities. Well, this is bringing crypto to people. This is empowering people with, with currency and with money and with the power of money. So very cool. I, I love what you guys are doing in Kenya. I've been following that project for quite a while now. So it's, it's, it's amazing to hear the updates about it. And it's great to see where it's going, of course. And so very, very cool. Galia, thank you so, so much for coming on the show today and sharing your insights on what's going on with EOS and what's you know, the latest from Bancor and, and some other updates as well. So thank you so, so much. Yeah, thank you for having me.